I want to thank you, Joe Buckwald, for being here and part of the Haight-Ashbury Oral History Project. Joe Buckwald is the father of Marty Ballon, as well as the early manager of Jefferson Airplane. I'd love to ask you where you were born. Where, where did you come from? And maybe a little about your father and your mother, your brothers and your sisters? Well, I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, September the 30th, 1917. Uh, my father... Uh, is from a country that's no more called Galicia, part of Poland now. And my mother was from Romania. And uh, all together there were uh, seven children. What was your mother and father's name? And my father's name was Samuel and my mother's name was Celia. And your uh, children, your brothers and sisters? I, my uh, my one brother was named Paris. Uh, my older sister, I, to be truthful with you, I, I have forgotten her name. It, I mean, did she have a nickname? I, I, I really <laughs> haven't seen her in many, 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 many years. But my others, uh, my one brother was named Simon. My other brother was named Isaac, and my sister was named Rose. Beautiful, beautiful. It tells me a lot about you. Um, where were you born? In Cleveland. And uh, um, what uh, could you tell me about your parents? Uh, um, do you think they influenced you in any way, uh, European upbringing? Well, my, uh, my dad first came to this country when he was nine years old. When he was 18, he went back uh, to Europe and put two years into the German army, which was required. After his two years in the German army, he came back to America. My mother came here when she was 18, and they both were in the needle trades. And uh, in those days, uh, you know, you just didn't go out uh, to nightclubs or things like that. You were in introduced by people who thought maybe you'd make a pair or make a couple. Well, there's an and that's how they met. That's right. Like in Fiddler on the Roof, they, the matchmaker, you know, kind of thing. Um, if, if there was anything you could say about your parents, what would you say? Well, my, my mother was a very uh, hard-working person. She, she had no education. She couldn't read or write. But uh, she had a lot of street smarts. Uh, my father was well-educated. He spoke about seven different languages. And uh, he was uh, very successful in the, uh, in the needle trades. Um, then you yourself, um, you got married at some point? Yeah, I got married uh, after I turned 19. In Cleveland? No, I got married in uh, Covington, Kentucky. No, I take it back, Newport, Kentucky. Okay. Because you couldn't get married in Ohio unless you were 21. But you could go over to Newport and lie about your age, and it was no problem. How did you, um, what, did, what, was, what, did, what was your wife's name? My wife's name was Catherine uh, Eugenia Edmonds. And uh, I think he said you had a picture of your wife? Yeah, I have a picture here. Um, how did you guys meet? Uh, I had come back from uh, I had come back from New York City, uh, and uh, uh, there was a place that I used to hang out called Grand Park. She happened to be working there, and I uh, I went into the uh, uh, park, and I happened to notice her, and I I asked her just to uh, make conversation if she'd seen my little brother. Naturally, <laughs> she hadn't seen my little brother. Just cut the and we, uh, I walked away, and then uh, I got up enough nerve to ask her out. Beautiful. So Three months later, we were married. Amazing. Met her in July. We were married in October. How many years you married? Uh, four months short of 67 years. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. If you had to say anything about her, what would you say? Well, I, uh, she was uh, she was very loyal. Uh, she uh, was well educated. 
Prior to her passing away, uh, she was the author of two books, one called Tilly, one called Short Stories. And I have uh, numerous other books that uh, she's written, which I haven't uh, sent to any publishers. It's the future. <laughs> and uh, she was a great mother. She was really a great mother. Amazing. And she was a great storyteller. Amazing. Uh, yeah. um, when did she pass on? She died uh, June the 3rd, uh, 2003. Um, well, we miss her and I feel her presence with us right now, so. Um, the two of you had some children? Yeah, I had a boy and I had a girl. My girl was the oldest by three years. And what was her name? Her name was Marilyn Joan. And then you had a boy? And boy was named Martin Jarrell. Martin Jarrell. Um, uh, where were the children born? In the children were born in Cincinnati, Ohio. And then at some point you came out to San Francisco. Yeah, I came out to San Francisco after I was discharged from the Navy in 1946. Uh, actually, I first came out here in 1944. Uh, I was in the Navy at that time and I went overseas and I was discharged uh, January 46. And then uh, we spent about a year in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, sold everything, and came out here in 1947. Um, your two children, do you remember approximately what year they were born? Yeah, Joan was born uh, October the 16th, 1938. She was 66 when she passed away. And Marty was born January the 30th, 1942. Do you have any pictures with you of your family? Yeah, Maybe we I can have, look uh, at them one and one by one, and you tell us who they are. Yeah. Uh, whoops. This is a picture of uh, Marty and his uh, young daughter, Delaney. So Martin is became Marty at a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. Was he called Martin through school? Uh, would I do what? Was was Marty called Marty through school? Was that a nickname from his friends? Oh, no, no. We, uh, in our family, every one uh, of the males was called Buck oh. by our friends. So to this day, I call Marty Buck when I talk to him. Wonderful. It's only when I uh, get angry or <laughs> get upset do I call him Marty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, this here is a, uh, a picture of uh, the girl in the middle is my uh, daughter, and the one on my right is my granddaughter, her daughter, and the one on the left is my great-granddaughter, Victoria. And then uh, this is a picture of my grandson who's uh, in the film industry, he's an assistant director on many movies. Who's he's a actor? Scott, Scott Benton. His name is Scott Benton. Yeah. And uh, this is a better picture of my great-granddaughter, Victoria. She's so a, she's you're not, be only, nine. not only a daughter, but you've gotten into the, you've earned the privilege to be a great. <laughs> And I have uh, I have uh, two other granddaughters. I have one granddaughter who's forty five, and I have a granddaughter who's forty one. But I don't have a picture of them. What's their names? Uh, one is Bonnie Sue. She lives in New York City, and the other one uh, is Jennifer Ann, and she lives in Oakland. How many total grandchildren? I have uh, four granddaughters, one great granddaughter, and one great and one grandson. Amazing. Um... When your children were young, um, was it hard? Did you have hard times raising the kids? Did you have, was it, was everything there? Did you have to work really hard for the days? Well, days? Uh, I had to work hard because I didn't have really a skill. I didn't have a profession. And so uh, until I really learned the trade, uh, 
Uh, yeah, I worked very hard. As a matter of fact, to, to give them what I thought they should have, I worked three different jobs. What type of jobs did you I do? I worked in uh, the printing business, lithography. I attended bar in a bowling alley at night, and I worked in an auto parts store. Wow. Any of these jobs in San Francisco? Uh, they were all in San Francisco, yeah. Um, anything in the Haight-Ashbury? Did you ever do any work in the Haight-Ashbury other than working with the band? No, I didn't, uh, I didn't work any place in there. But the in San Francisco? Yeah. And the date you arrived in San Francisco was around 1964? No, we came here in 1947. You came here in 1947? 1947, August of 1947. And where did you land? What part of, uh... uh we got here late at night, and uh, you know the view on top of the hill on Market Street? Well, that's where we parked and slept in a car. And then the next day, we headed downtown and parked and took a room at the Gordon Hotel. Wow, what a long road. And then we stayed at the Gordon Hotel, and I heard about two rooms up on Bush Street. And we stayed at the, those two rooms for a while, and then I heard, because I was a veteran, that I could get in public housing in Richmond. And so I went over there, and I, I got a three-bedroom flat uh, in public housing. This, um, uh, were you just out of the military, or was it... Well, I was out of the military. It was a little over a year, sure. So when did you go in the military? I went in in June 1944, and I was discharged in January 1946. Which which part of the military? The Navy. The Navy. I right? spent all my time overseas. Wow. Um, I was curious, um, what was the world situation at that time? What uh, uh, were we were at war? We well, we were at war. We uh, were trying to defeat fascism. Exactly which was going on uh, throughout Europe and throughout Asia. Do you belong to any veterans organizations now? Uh, no, I, uh, I never joined any uh, of the veterans organizations for the simple reason that at that time, after the war, they required a loyalty oath, and I always refused to sign a loyalty oath. What was a loyalty oath? The loyalty oath that uh, you didn't belong to any communist organization or you weren't a communist. You wanted to be a free thinker. You didn't overthrow, you didn't believe in the overthrow of the government. So. What was your reason for not signing? What was my reason for, well, I didn't believe in that. Right. I, you know. Exactly. So you could be you free. Know. You can be a free thinker. You know, I, 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 I believe that uh, you, you, you should be entitled to join any organization you want to join, you know. Exactly. And uh, as long as it's not uh, an organization that uh, intends to overthrow the government by force and violence. Exactly. So, Would you re recommend young people to join the service today or not? Uh, no, no. I, uh, I kept my son out of the Vietnam War. I made him a conscientious objector. Exactly. Yeah, so he wouldn't go based on my own experiences. What did you do after the military in the next few years after that? After that, I, I went back into lithography. I went back into lithography and I became a, uh, a skilled uh, pressman. Wow. So, you know, I learned the trade so I could make more money. When uh, you were racing, you then moved to the Haight-Ashbury? Uh, we moved into the, the Hayden on Central in, in the early 50s. And how old were the children around then? Uh, let's see, I would say Marty was about 10 and Joan was about 15. I mean 13. 13. 13. So he's the younger of the two. Yeah. Um, did either of the kids, uh, as they were growing up in those years, uh, show you any characteristics, characteristics and traits of talent? Um, well, uh, yes. Uh, my daughter uh, played the piano, tap dance, and uh, she was very good at it. And Marty uh, was, from the time he was five years old, used to entertain us with his magic tricks and his uh, uh, singing and his dancing. One thing Marty liked to do, he liked to in those days, his mother used to go to the Episcopal Church, and Marty used to love to sing in a choir. 
and during the holidays, he used to love to go out and sing all the carols. So. Uh, where do you think he, they got this musical? Where did it come from? Did well, I don't know. Life? My daughter, I not, not my my father was a violinist. He played the violin, and their mother was a ballet dancer and an artist. So wow. maybe they got their talent there. I have no idea. You were the backbone. I can't read a note. I don't play any instruments. So. Right. And you, were, I know that feeling, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. Um, uh, so then you moved to from Central. And uh, to where from there? Well, I moved from Central <coughs> to a place on Anza. So and then. And that was about what year? Oh my! The fifties. I really sometime. don't remember the year, but I know it's before she graduated from high school. My daughter. What year and what inspired you to move to the Haight-Ashbury area? Well, uh, a friend of mine uh, lived there on Central, on the. Uh, second floor and the floor first floor was empty and I wanted to get back to San Francisco from the housing project right and so uh, I took that flat that was the reason for that and when Marty was about how old at that point teenager or? no I, I I would say it was still about in 10 school. then yeah I think it was about 10 and then when did you move, I, bl I believe, uh, your house on Belvedere? On Belvedere, uh, my daughter first had the house. And then uh, she uh, got involved. Uh, she has a PhD in education. She got involved with Stanford doing these different projects, teaching teachers how to teach and, and teaching students how to learn. And uh, she did a lot of traveling, and uh, so uh, I just took over the house and moved into it. Super. And when was that about? Gosh, I, I've been there, what, 16, 17 years. So. Wow. So, what, what and that's where you're president. 1988 or something like and that. And that's where you're presently living in Belvedere? What's that? Is that where you're presently living? Yeah. So... You were probably living on Central, am I correct, when you started come to, coming to the Haight-Ashbury? Well, when I lived on Central, uh, you know, there were there was one great deli right around the corner where everybody used to go to and charge their groceries if sure. you didn't have cash. There were a lot of empty stores. Those were the days when the neighborhood was... Yeah, and you had the straight theater, you know. Right. So we used to go there once a week. And what happened at the straight theater? When you would go, they just see movies, and they showed. So it was a movie house. Yeah, I know. yeah, it was a very good, cheap at that time, very reasonable movie house, and they advertised what was going to be playing, and once yeah. a week they showed the movies. Yeah. And what day do you remember of the week? Did they? Oh, do I that? I don't recall no okay. what days. Um, uh, and your whole family used to go, or yeah, the whole family. It was an outing, yeah. and reasonable. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we were very close. We did everything together. Um, were you involved at all when uh, your children became serious about their music? Um, did your daughter ever become serious about her No, music? my daughter never became serious about music or dancing. Uh, she uh, became serious about education. She was uh, very serious about education and trying to make things better for teachers, trying to make things better for students. And then children. And that's that was her career. Yes, and and uh, Marty. Marty, um, Marty became interested in uh, in music and dancing, and a friend of his. Uh, I don't know if you ever remember the theater in the round. Sure. Uh, down on uh, South Van Ness. Sure. Across from the, uh, I, I forget the name of the fast food place. Uh, a friend of Marty's uh, uh, went down there. Marty was about 16 at the time, I think. And he, he told Marty he was going down to try out for a part in the theater around. So Marty says, I'll go with you. And uh, so... Uh, what year was this about? Do you remember? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, I would say about 1958. Okay. And uh, so Marty went down there and uh, they asked him to try out. And uh, he be, he was in quite a few things down there. He was in Guys and Dolls. He was in uh, uh, 
uh, some uh, Shakespeare stuff, and uh, that's where we met Phil Graham. Oh, do you? Phil Graham played Big hear. Julie in Guys and Dolls. That's right, he did. Yeah. Yes, he did. And Marty did West Side Story there. So was Marty in the same performance with Bill? Or yeah, what? yeah, he was in Guys and Dolls. Mm -hmm. I forget what Marty was doing, but uh, like I say, that's when we met Phil. A, a lot of people don't realize that uh, performers in music have have other sides to them, like Bill Graham, the promoter, was also an actor. And right, Guy, right. Guys and Dolls, Apocalypse Now, Bugsy, The Cotton Club, and yeah. many others. Very interesting. Is So that's when Marty met Bill. And uh, did a musical relationship start at all? or uh, The musical relationship didn't start until uh, uh, Bill opened up the Fillmore. That's right. Yeah. Was it 85? So he was acting at that point, um, uh, and I'm sure you were involved in bringing him or watching his performances and things like that. Um, yeah, I was always I was always there for Marty. I was always involved in everything he ever did. When uh, and I'm sure you still are. <laughs> I know that you still are. Um, when did uh, it turn at all where he can showcase his musical instruments and and. Uh, did uh, he joined a band? But did he ever play on his own? Uh, yeah, well, well, Marty Marty during the folk area played with a group known as the San Francisco Town Criers. Oh, there were three fellows and a girl, and uh, uh, the first time they played was a little bar on Sutter Street, and uh, they got as far as playing at the uh, Mates Hotel in Reno. And uh, then the uh, the folk scene uh, went into uh, the rock and roll scene, you know. Right. And uh, Marty used to go to the drinking bar. That's where he met Paul. And he asked Paul if he'd like to, you know, form and organize a band with him and do rock and roll. Where was that place located? What part the, of the, the city? drinking door was down on uh, Union Street. On Union Street, okay. Yeah. Do you think it's still there? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I used to go there all the time. And then, so now Marty and Paul have a relationship, and uh, did they play together, or did they? No, they had no. Other they they had a relationship. Uh, they found uh, Yorma. And, how did they meet Yorma? Uh, Yorma brought in Jack. Do you know how they met them? And uh, and uh, I don't know how Sid got involved. And uh, then they had this drummer. Uh, who they had to let go because they all had their hair grown long and he <laughs> refused to have long hair. <laughs> so they let him go. And uh, So what were the band members' full names at this point? At this point, well, there was Marty Ballin, Paul Kantner, Yorma Copeland, Jack Cassidy, Sig Anderson, and uh, Skip Spence uh, became the drummer. Bless his soul. Yes. Yeah. Who was and then you gone. had Signe yeah. as a singer. From Anderson. Yeah. Exactly. So what were some of the shows and who was getting their bookings? Who was doing their managing? Who was helping well, them in the, the way to get uh, the, the, the fellow that uh, saw them at the, the Matrix became their manager. But prior to that, no one was booked. Was booked. that Matthew Case? Yeah, Matthew Case. And prior to that, no one was... Uh, really managing them. How did they get the uh, name? How did they get the name? Yeah. Um, did you, your, your view? How they you claim, it? they claim that uh, they took the name Jefferson from some old blues guy and the airplane from a dog. So I'm, I'm not really sure. <laughs> we'll have to ask Marty know, that. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, they, they started playing shows at the Matrix? Well, prior to that, uh, there was a, a, a group who formed a family dog, and uh, they hired the Jefferson Airplane to, for their first show at the Longshore Hall. They, and, weren't they also the first show at the Film Auditorium? When Bill yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the uh, family dog wanted to make up a poster and so they told Marty, they says, uh, we'd like to make a poster, but we don't know where to go. 
to have it printed. So he says, why don't you go see my father? Because he's in that business. So uh, Kelly did the first poster on my table. And if anybody oh. has one of those black and white posters, I mean, I never took any in those days. Well, we'll uh, see what we can if do. If anyone <laughs> has one of those posters, those posters are worth over 10000 each. Ten right. cent piece of paper. But uh, they had no money, and they came and saw me, and so we made a deal. I'd give them 1,000, 17 by 22 black and whites, and then I'd come to the show, stand outside the box office, and the first $100 was mine. That's all <laughs> I charged them for 1,000 posters. So that's how we played it then, those days. Exactly. Because exactly. nobody had any money. And the business was being formed as And then was, what was happened, formed. the way the Matrix got formed, uh, Marty had met some stockbrokers, three guys who were in the uh, brokerage business, and they were interested in forming him a club and giving Marty a piece of the action. And so they found this uh, place, this empty place on, uh, uh, let's see, I, I think it's Chestnut, yeah next to the Pierce Annex, and uh, they opened up a club called The Matrix. And Right uh, now, it's, it's right off of Lombard. Yeah, exactly. right off of Union there mm -hmm. in Fillmore, yeah. Exactly. And uh, the first act, uh, and the house band was the Jefferson Airplane. And so... Uh, this was a small place. It was a very small place, and the, the first oh. night it was just jam-packed full. How, how many do you think it would hold? Oh, I don't know, no more than 150. Right. So. Were the lines at some point just around the block? Yeah. And you couldn't get oh, in? yeah. It was always packed. It was all. Everybody played there. Quicksilver, Santana, Big Brother, and the Holding Company. Beautiful day. Exactly. You know, the Grateful Dead. Um, and Wes Wilson did a lot of artwork on those shows. Well, well, Wes Wilson, he did the artwork mainly for Bill. You know. Mm -hmm. Mainly, the only reason that uh, Wes quit doing the artwork is because Bill wouldn't pay him a hundred dollars for each design and give him ten cents for each poster. Right. And that's where Bonnie stepped in and did a few of the posters exactly. before he got, uh, you oh, know, other artists. other artists to get involved. Right. Um, I heard some story. Uh, let me know if it's true. They didn't have a way to get their equipment to the shows sometimes. And there was something about taking a bus ride with their equipment. Um, that they would take a bus from where they were. They would hand carry their equipment to get to. Yeah, the, yeah, to, yeah. Because they couldn't afford to have, hire a truck. So they know. would take all their equipment yeah. on yeah. the bus with them, drums, you name it, and they got to there, and that's how they got there and got home, <laughs> or got lucky and had somebody with the truck yeah. or something. Or to somebody get with a car. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, were you involved? Uh, any other way at that point besides printing the posters? Did you see yourself getting more involved? Uh, I, uh, the only way I was involved was with Marty. Uh, I mean, in the beginning, you said something about me managing the uh, the airplane. I never did manage the airplane. Uh, you like there were Marty's certain people in the group that wanted me. There were other people that didn't want me because I was Marty's father. I won't mention their names, but uh, that's the way it stacked up. That's the way it moved. They, they felt that uh, I would favor Marty against everybody else. But you were like Marty's personal manager. Well, I've always been Marty's, uh, I've been Marty's personal manager, his gopher, his attorney, his accountant, you know, his legal advisor. Exactly. You know. So, um, through, through, through the Matrix days, um... And Matthew Cates was their manager eventually. Well, Matthew Cates came into the picture. Uh, he saw him at the Matrix, and uh, he told him he could get him a recording deal. And it was the first time in the history of the recording business that anybody ever got an advance. So he got him a $25,000 advance, which made them very happy. But and they so do with they the money. signed with him. What did they do with the money? Did they buy equipment? But uh, I, I think... Uh, I mean, it's it's hard for me to say whether he kept most of the money because of expenses or what happened. Exactly. But after about uh, two years, 
they decided to drop him because uh, uh, they weren't benefiting like they thought they should. And then after they dropped Cates, he didn't sue until the Pillow album became successful. Right. And then he filed suit. And then we spent 25 years in litigation, and that litigation ate up millions of dollars in uh, publishing and mechanical monies that they had coming th I from think, RCA. I uh, think Jefferson Airplane, as well as Moby Grape, as well as It's a Beautiful Day, went through a lot of that same well, Yeah, road. even today, it's Matthew it's spends his life just suing. Right. He's got sues going left and right. It's become a profession. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's called me up many times uh, find out certain information, and he leaves his number, and I never call him back. I think you're... I'm not interested. I think everybody in the family sort of plays it the same way. <laughs> you know. At this point. That's his life's goal, sue everybody. Right. Um, where When when Kate's left the scene, who picked up the management and the booking, and... Uh, Bill Graham came in as their manager. And... Uh, and the reason... Long? The reason they left Graham is because he worked them too much. He right. booked them too much. At a certain point, uh, Gray Slick got involved. Yeah, Sig, uh, Sig left the band. Sig left the band in Chicago. She had married a guy uh, uh, who uh, took it upon himself to convince her that she was the star and that she should have better conditions and better benefits and more money. They had a little baby, and when they played Chicago, they, they were living in a little cold water room, and so he convinced her to leave the band, and then... Uh, there was no singer. The, the band at that time was living on uh, Fell Street. Uh, Jack was living there, Marty was living there. I don't know if Paul was there or not, or Yorman. That's the building with the big white columns. And uh, they were discussing getting another girl. I was there at the time. And I mentioned to them that uh, Great Society had broken up and Grace Slick was free, you know. Why don't they talk to her? So they decided to send Jack to talk to her, and that's how that came about. But what year was that about? Gosh, yeah. I don't... It could have been, let's see, the Pillow album came yeah. out what, 67? So it might have been 67, 68. I'm not sure. And then, so at that point, you had Grace. Do you remember the first show that was played with Grace? Was I don't remember the first show, no. The first one of the first few no, shows? I don't remember the first show. But Bill was managing at that time, and uh, Grace had these, brought in these two songs, White Rabbit, Somebody to Love, and uh, Today was on the album, and Graham wanted the, the, the song today, Marty's song, to be the single. And Paul kept insisting on Grace's song, Somebody to Love, you know, and White Rabbit. And when push came to shove, it was Somebody to Love. Didn't and, Marty uh, run a, write a song, The Summer of Love? Yeah, Marty wrote a song, but that's much later. Much later. Much later. Is that yeah. after 67? Uh, oh, yeah, way, yeah. Way he, he wrote The Summer of Love. Uh, Gosh, somewhere in the late 80s or early 90s, yeah. So they were living at that almost small mansion on Fell Street, uh, that, on Fell Well, they Street. bought that mansion, uh, they bought that mansion for $70,000 at the time. It was all run down. It's oh. the same mansion that Caruso stayed in the 1906 earthquake. What street's that between? On That's Fel on, uh, on, uh, uh, Fulton. Uh, I can't I remember the cross street. Right, right and near the park. so uh, they used that as their office, and everybody stayed there. Yeah. Paul had a room there. I've been there. So the rest <laughs> of them, yeah. Exactly. Marty had a room there. There was some kind of rumor that they all drove Mercedes or Rolls Royces or no, that, that, that that airplane wasn't, hangar no, or something. No, no, no. Marty had an old Volkswagen. I don't know what Paul drove. The, the guy that drove the best car was Yor Yorman. I think he bought, was it such a car as a Lotus or something yes, like that? Yes, yes, Yeah, he bought something like that. Yeah, they all, I mean, when you, you got a name like Airplane, you got a, a, a band name like Jefferson Airplane and all kinds of rumors go yeah. through. So 
kind of, this is what we're doing is setting the record straight. I imagine you know? they drove good cars, but like I say, at that time, Marty had a, a white Volkswagen that we bought new. White Rabbit? <laughs> white Rabbit. How long were they in that house on uh, Fell? I, mean, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. When, uh, approximately when did they move out? Marty, Marty left in 1970, and I don't remember when they moved out. Right. Um... So, were you at that show at the Fillmore? That the first show they played? Uh, yeah. Was that was there a big crowd and? Yeah, I, uh, I had a standing invitation by Bill to attend any show, and any time I showed up, they were to let me in. You know, so I never really missed the show. And uh, I thought it was the greatest scene in the world. You know, I thought the revolution was, had come again, <laughs> and the social changes were going to take place, but. Right, and then, people, the drugs, then the drugs got in and everything got ruined. That's right. Alcohol, drugs, it just changes everything. Um, on, uh, had you ever, uh, had they, any, any of them ever played at the Straight Theater? or? Um, they didn't play the Straight Theater, but we had a club called the I-Beam. Yes. They played at the I-Beam one or two, three times. And that was on H Street that between was on Cole H Street. and Schrader. Yeah. And, uh, uh. I know the band uh, didn't play for a while um, and then came back again and now they're going strong and we're 2005. Um, when they played a couple of times, did they ever play before? Did they, you know, when they played that 2000, you know, when they played a few years ago, what was it, 10 years ago? And um, Did they ever play the I-Beam in the early years? No, no, no. Okay. I'm not, yeah, we need to document when that place opened. <laughs> But, I don't remember when they opened. I don't remember when they closed. I think it was part of it, you know, in the 80s and the this late 70s and the 80s. Um, uh, were you there at that performance when they played the I-Beam? Yeah. yeah. In, uh, on Hate Street? Uh, it was like the beginning of them all rejoining and playing again. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the that show or a little bit about um, what brought the band back together again and why did they decide to be a band to keep and move on and continue that to I play? couldn't tell you I, I really you know I did probably about that performance probably that money night. they probably needed money who knows that's right <laughs> and they always needed money but then none of them ever stopped playing you were they were always playing and Marty yeah, they, was playing yeah so was Marty playing through those years uh, yeah Marty privately yeah and Marty's, Marty's had during those years he's had uh, the Marty Ballin Band, he had uh, Bodacious, uh, he had the Wolfpack Band, uh, and uh, he played solo with uh, Slick Aguilar. Oh. So he still plays solo with Slick Aguilar once in a while. So at present, Marty plays with and the he band. plays he plays with people in Florida where he lives now. So, do you know anything about the name changes? I mean, we ended up with Jefferson Airplane, and then we ended up with Starship, and then we, and then you had Hot Tuna, and they were all offsprings. Of well, Hot Tuna, Hot Tuna came about when we did the uh, Network Festival in England. Mm. Uh, the uh, Hot Tuna consisted of uh, uh, Yorma, Jack, Marty. Joey Covington as a drummer, mm -hmm. and their first performance uh, was as a, a opener at the uh, Network Festival, where the Jefferson Airplane also performed. Approximately what year? Gosh, I, 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 it was in the seventies. I the know 70s. that, and yeah. uh, or maybe even prior to that, because Marty left them in the nineteen seventy, so it had to be maybe sixty nine, probably. But anyway, uh, the reason Marty didn't stay with Hot Tuna is because Yorma kept putting him down because he, he Mar, uh, Yorma liked to play the blues and sing himself, you know, and and so he'd keep putting Marty down, doing all these love songs. Like so Marty just Marty know, walked wanted, away from it. Marty wanted to do love songs. Yeah, well, he always did. Sure. That's what he's good at, ballads sure. and love songs. Sure, sure. So he just walked away from it. So, and um, then uh, uh, when the uh, uh, airplane really broke up, you know, when Yorman left and Jack left and uh, 
So they wanted to uh, uh, get a band together. Uh, they couldn't use the name Jefferson Airplane. They could use the name Jefferson. So Paul's always been into the space stuff, the Star Wars stuff, you know. So he created the name Jefferson Starship. That's how that came about. You, would you know when that was approximately? What decade? What year? I have no idea. No problem. I mean, I'm That's sure it was before 1980 because Starship's been around quite a while. Quite a while. Yeah. Quite a while. Um, um, I know you brought some other materials with you. <coughs> and I'd love us to maybe take a look at some of them and maybe uh, take some of these photos and put them in a safe place. Um, well, these are just... When we played Japan as a Marty Ballin band, so these are just... Uh, so the band really did world tours and oh, yeah. went everywhere. Yeah. So pretty much everywhere in the world they're singing yeah, in, their uh, songs. In the early 80s, <coughs> EMI sent us over to record in Japan, you know. And uh, so... Uh, so BMI uh, sent you over to Japan to they, record? Uh, what's that? Where did they send you, uh, uh, BMI? They sent us to Tokyo to record for EMI Tokyo. Right. So, uh, so this we, is we an, went over there with a band. This is an article in what publication? Uh, this is called Musica and Sun. What year? Uh, 1982. Okay, so that's about then. And so what it's, else? There's just different sure. articles on Marty that uh, this, this Japanese. Japanese publication. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is... Uh, Press photos and, and uh, music articles. And what's in, is there a way to see the name of that magazine? So, and uh, here? I mean, it's all in Japanese, so sure. hey, I, I can't help you there on dates. And uh, uh, let's see. This, this is called one. Music Gent. M music Gent. If we could take the post it off the corner of that magazine, Joe. What's that? On the corner, there's a post-it. If we can take that off. To share? Is that? Okay. And then if we hold that up here, I think we can get a closer look at it. Can you tell us about that article? Really? I can't tell you about the article because I can't read the language. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but does the picture remind you of anything? You know, just that uh, it, Marty was a big favorite, and so they did a, they did a great publicity job on him. And, and this is, uh, these are the type of uh, tour book, uh, tour books that uh, the Starship always puts out. Why don't we hold that still, see if we can get a close-up of that. Did, uh, so different people did their artwork, and a lot of the times you did their printing. Uh, yeah, different people did their artwork. Always, yeah. People were always submitting album covers and, and artwork. And, so let's uh, put those off to be more comfortable. Uh, things of that sort. It looks like there you got an interesting letter from the past. Yeah, this this is a letter that uh, Bill Graham sent me, where I asked him to uh, uh, let my uh, niece go backstage, you know. So so he wrote me a letter telling me that. Uh, he wrote me a letter telling me that it's up to the group whether anybody comes backstage or not. That he always gives me as many tickets as I want, you know. So I appreciated that. You know. So it's, it pretty much was uh, Bill Graham's house, but yeah. whatever band came in. Yeah, whatever was his band guest. was there, if they wanted you to come back, you know. He gave the problem. house to the band. I mean, it wasn't a problem. We got backstage that night, so it wasn't a problem. No. Nope. So he gave you sort of all access. And then the the other thing here, this is just some poetry that uh, my wife wrote in 1964. Uh, would you like to read a little bit of it? Not really. Okay, a lot. <laughs> not really. <laughs> not, not that it's not good, but, uh, you know. So, so she was writing all the time. You had one playing piano, the other one playing. Yeah, my missus always wrote. I mean, I got 
all kind of things that she's written. In the, in the future, maybe uh, we could put it together and have artwork and poetry. And yeah, I be, hope so. I hope so. I think yeah. it's a great idea. Um, when, uh, in the days of the straight theater and uh, in that period in the 60s, in the Haight-Ashbury, um, it, you would be walking down the street. Uh, in your memory, uh, are there any changes on the street? Did, was there anything there that is not here now um, well, that you now, remember? Now you have uh, all, all the stores are occupied. You have shoe stores. You, you know, you have, you have clothing stores. You have restaurants. So it, it's a, a whole new scene. In those days, in the hippie days, you had a lot of empty stores. You know? Right. Uh, the two yeah. of us that used to come through, people would be scared to death to get off of them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and seeing all these weird people. Do you remember? According to them. But uh, it's, it's today, uh, there's still a lot of young people trying to relive the 60s. Yep. But I don't think that's possible. I don't think they'll ever come back. Do you remember the drugstore cafe on Masonic and the psychedelic yeah. shop? Yeah. And um, the the boot hook with the shoes and there were meeting places along the street. Is there any place that you can think no. of, like the boot hook or places like that, that you remember that were gathering places or places to go have a cocktail or an event happening that is not there right now? No, I don't. Uh... Well, the psychedelic shop, had you ever walked in there? Yeah, I've been in there, yeah. That's where they used to give out the posters for the you upcoming know. shows. But, uh, I mean, I, I, I myself very seldom went into any of the places, you know. Right. Yeah. So, um... I uh, mean, I used to see people on the street. Right. It's a family on the street. Today, I see no one. In those days, you saw everyone. All the guys from the different groups. And it was a today, home. Had the Grateful Dead. Yeah, hanging today, out you, on the you steps. don't see anybody. Yeah. Even if you go to a concert, you don't see them. Unless, yes. <laughs> Unless they're playing themselves. That's right. That's right. And some of those that I've seen at the concerts and who have performed with us, uh, I mean, I'm amazed at the change in their appearance. I hardly recognize them. Right. What, um, what you, you live now in Belvedere, and uh, you interact with Marty when he comes in town. You help him like a personal manager still, if you can. I was real curious if you had any plans for your future. Um, you live in yeah, Europe. we're, uh, Marty right now is working on his own album. Does uh, it have a name? We've, o over the years, we've done lots and lots of recording on our own. Uh, material that no one has ever heard. Material that the record company didn't want. And so Marty's uh, going through it, and uh, he's putting together his own album. He's enhancing uh, the music. He's enhancing the sound. And we got we hope to come out with something soon. Oh, that's very exciting. Hopefully yeah. when uh, this tape is viewed in 100 years from now, it will be a collector's item. <laughs> I have point. collector's items now. <laughs> right. Um, I would love to ask you um, if you could take anything from this whole life experience of uh, your family, your children, you've been so uh, privileged to be involved and be there when it was all happening and it's continuing. Um, could you take anything from that, uh, some spirit or something, that if young people in the future view this tape, that somehow um, they can get a feeling of what went went down and somehow get inspired by what you think young people should be thinking about or in our world in the future. Well, as far as the future goes, what I would tell young people today and those who come along in the future is that uh, we look beyond race, we look beyond the color of our skin, we look at each other as being just human beings who, uh, you know, are in this world 
really a short time and that uh, you know you're your brother's keeper and you should be helping each other and doing for each other and uh, eliminating eliminating uh, uh, the uh, monies that are drained away because of the military and because of wars. And that's uh, what I think uh, will make it a better world. What is what, give me a name of one of Marty's, of your favorite songs. My, my favorite song of Marty's is Coming Back to Me. I just love that song. When I pass away, I hope they play that song for me. Well, we hope you're with us a way, way long when time. When mother passed away, I had Ma Marty do that song at a show one night for in her honor. Beautiful. Well, Joe, we want to really thank you uh, for this interview. Um, it is a privilege. Thank you for sharing your life with us. And um, we'll, we will do more of these. And uh, uh, it, you're an inspiration. You're a great part of the period. And uh, hopefully when young people look at this in the future, they'll, they'll realize that um, uh, they can do something as well. You know, and I just want to thank you so much. Well, I thank you.